Professor Andrew Lees, welcome to About Books. I remember buying a guinea pig and I was about 10 years of age and it set me off. I thought, when I grow up, I want to have a pet shop. Neurologist, how does that work out as a boy? Where does that come from? Can I take you right back and, and what are the origins that led you in that direction? Well, it's not direct and it certainly was nothing to do with dressing up as a doctor and playing with girls dressed up as nurses when I was a small child. Um, I was very interested in travel from an early age and I think that stemmed from the fact that uh, my father, who was a school teacher in St. Helens, uh, used to bring me every weekend to Liverpool uh, and we used to look out at the sea and we used to watch the ships coming in in the 1950s there was still plenty of traffic on on the water at that time and i think what watching bales of cotton from brazil and fruit coming in from the caribbean and so on enchanted me really and um when i left liverpool at the age of nine it was very difficult for me i mean i think you 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 i know you lived in leeds so i mean moving from uh, the northwest to the northeast is a difficult business, particularly if your father thinks that he's still living in the northwest. So we lived as exiles, really, uh, in Leeds, um, across the other side of the Pennines. There's a different um, humour there, wasn't there? Well, there was no humour, no, really. <laughs> but, um, yeah, quite. One thing I learned in <laughs> Leeds was how to peel an orange without taking it out of my pocket. Uh, right. But no, nothing much else. So it was, it was quite difficult. I think it must have been as difficult as moving from Belfast to Dublin or mm. Dublin mm. to Belfast mm. and certainly more difficult than moving from Edinburgh to Glasgow. So I found that very difficult and I retreated uh, into, maybe not retreated, but I got very interested in natural history. And um, I used to frequent an edge land on the outskirts of Leeds Gledhow, it's quite, mm. quite near round eh? mm. um, uh, and I made this my home so I would spend many hours uh, cataloguing bees and butterflies and uh, recording grasses and watching the skylarks and so on and then one day um, in the 60s uh, Leeds City Council decided that they wanted to build a new uh, council estate on this area of land and it was all bulldozed away and um, I'm beginning to sound pretty wet by these little things <laughs> affecting me, but it did affect me a lot. Yeah. Um, and I kind of retreated to my bedroom in the local public library. Um, and I started to read more and more fantasy natural history, um, books by the Victorian naturalists on travels to the Amazon mm -hmm. and so on. And I became very wrapped up with um, uh, the Amazon forest and the rainforest. And I really wanted um, to become the next David Attenborough, mm. really, and spend, escape to take a boat from Liverpool and n not come back. What was your parents thinking, really, in, in pushing you towards medicine uh, rather than... I mean, they um, thought there was no you... jobs in natural so history was one thing. I mean, in job. those days, yeah, safe yes. job, yeah. safe job. And of course, uh, respectable profession, I suppose, th those kind of things. Um, can you describe the medical world that you found yourself in? I found it difficult at first. One of the things that the interview I said, as well as the natural history, was that the, uh, I was asked why uh, I'd chosen the Royal London Hospital as opposed to the other 11 London, London medical schools, you know, as Guy's, Bart, St. Thomas's. And I remember saying that it was close to the port. And this kind of uh, raised a couple of chuckles amongst a couple of the, inter the, the people interviewers. And as I was going out, I saw these two people look, sort of smiling conspiratorially with one another. And I didn't know whether that was going to be a good sign or, or not. But anyway, I did. I got in. And uh, in those days, it was very different. The interview was very important. Yeah. And if they liked you and they thought you were going to be a good doctor, you, you, all you had to do was pass your A-levels. You didn't have to get three A's at A-level, as is it's now all done on uh, A-level grades now. So I got in, provided I didn't flunk my A-levels, I was in. Okay. You know, so I wasn't, I, wasn't under, yeah, okay. uh, I wasn't under pressure to uh, 
so when I, I mean, I found it difficult at medical school at first. I mean, I missed the North a lot uh, in London at that time, uh, although it was the swinging 60s by mm. that stage, King's Road, it was very trendy and so on, and there was plenty to do. Um, but I kind of went in on myself a lot in the first 18 months and um, study helped me to survive. So I kind of engrossed myself in my books um, and became quite antisocial, I have to say, looking back uh, at that stage. And then later on, uh, when we got onto the wards, um, again, I found it re really quite difficult. I found the, uh, coping with suffering uh, uh, dealing with the realities of medicine, difficult. Um, uh, coping with um, misery and sadness and mm. uh, incurable diseases mm. was hard. Mm. Uh, and I was also very self-conscious and, and not very confident. Um, uh, to give you a kind of um, idea of what medical schools were like at that time, it's very different now. I mean, our, our group were 80 people. Uh, most of them were from public schools. There was a, a few grammar school boys, so, some like me from the north, but of, of the uh, intake, I would say 60 or 70 percent of them were from public schools. Uh, we had only six girls uh, out of a, an intake of 80, mm. and there were no black uh, students at mm. all. So that, that was the kind of setup. Many people got in uh, because they were good at rugby. Many people got in because their fathers were doctors. Mm. Um, and at first it didn't bother me too much, but then when I got on the wards, um, I, I began to, you know, some people would take the piss out of me from my accent, which you may think is not particularly strong now, but I had flat vowels. Mm. And, um, it, and I found those kind of things really quite difficult. I also found some of the things um, which actually were going on in the hospital quite difficult to deal with too. So for example, um, we would be allowed to do vaginal examinations on anaesthetized women without mm. their consent. Mm. Uh, this was standard practice at that time. We were told... Um, what was the thinking behind that? It was just standard practice. I right. mean, the, the, you know, it, it was a teaching hospital. Yeah. So people who were admitted to the hospital understood that there were medical students there. Okay. But it, uh, the, the consent was not implicit at the time. So, and then, you know, as medical students, we'd be told, oh, go and look at the gastric cancer case at the end of the ward. You know, so that's mm. how you'd refer to mm. the case. And in the medical... Um, Met the doctor's mess and the student's mess. You know, we'd talk about patients as crumble and things like that, patients who were elderly and you couldn't do much about them. So uh, I was quite sort of sensitive to some of those things, um, uh, even at that time. How do you get beyond that? You, you mentioned the sadness before yeah, of just dealing yeah. with people who are ill. You know, that's I, I got beyond it because I got beyond it through my teachers, many of whom were, in, uh, as, as we all often do, many of my teachers were inspirational. Uh, mm. I was um, impressed by the um, nursing, uh, many of the nurses who I really admired for the work that they did. And one of my very first teachers was really one of the nursing sisters on the ward. In those days, nursing sisters ran the ward like mm. a ship. Mm. You know, it was not like it is now. Uh, they ran the cleaners, they ran the domestics. They were in charge. Mm. You had to ask their permission to even go on the ward to see patients. So it's a different world now, but that was how it was in those days. And of course, they, kn they knew much more medicine often than the doctors. But some of my teachers were really, I mean, powers of powers for goodness mm. and um, I've never really regretted becoming a doctor although I in every day that I practice now I still doubt what I'm doing I doubt what I'm doing is always right I question my decisions mm. um, and I still do that even now today but the the, the brotherhood of medicine uh, I enjoy and like uh, and the collegiate nature of it uh, has always been something that I've really, really enjoyed. Uh, so I, ha I don't have any regrets, but it was um, at that time, um, 
in my second and third clinical year, and of course this was the time of the count counterculture, the Beatles, mm. the King's Road, uh, the, f the Summer of Love, 67. Uh, so there were a lot of influences e that even got to medical students. Of course, medical students were always a bit separate from the rest of the university and that we were doing apprenticeships and we weren't necessarily always exposed to all the cultural influences that most people who go to university were. But nevertheless, it got through. Um, was and it the world of Richard Gordon? Doctor in yeah, the house? Well, that was, was the was world, that? yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. that, that was the world that were living and of course yeah. that was the, th those were the c kind of books that um, along with the story of uh, Axel Munth and A.J. Cronin's The, Cru uh, the Crucible w which I don't think are very good books for aspiring medical students to read because they romanticize medicine mm. a lot but mm. those were the books and that was the kind of world in a way it was but um, I, I had this I suppose it's a kind of, you could say it was a self-destructive impulse or, or at least a, a mildly rebellious impulse and, and that's what drew me uh, as a medical student to read uh, The Naked Lunch by William Burroughs. Ah, now you mention in your book, Mentored by a Madman, um, that neurologists prefer their own company. Um, you chose not to be entombed and do you think that is partly by your involvement with William Burroughs or him coming into your world? Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, I think, to, again, we were talking before we got on the television about cultural influences and the time. Mm. And of course, at that time, people of my generation were um, aware of control and we were taught to rebel against control mm. not to acquiesce and indeed as a Merseysider in particular yeah. perhaps. so yeah. exactly so yeah. the, the, the there was um, a, a rebellious nature among students at that time and of yeah. course the student the West student revolution at that time in the 60s in, in London as well as in France and in Germany. So the background was actually there, although it did, it, it, as you, you've already really pointed out, the, um, the doctor in the house idea was much more the prevalent one at the time, yeah. but there were seeds of rebellion which even got as far as medicine. And um, Burroughs, uh, I read, uh, I think like most people who read it in England at that time, found it uh, skatological, uh, pornographic, in many ways revolting and lurid. Mm. Uh, and it had that effect on me too. I mean, I found a lot of it... Uh, Can you sum him up in, in for, for any viewers who you know, may not have come across the man before? Um, is it possible to sum him up in a... Um, <laughs> briefly? Well, it... I think, he, I mean, what he taught, I mean, The Naked Lunch is a sort of picaresque journey, a stream of consciousness, which Burroughs himself said that you could take the individual chapters, drop them on the pl for, floor, shuffle them, and read them in any order you wanted. So uh, this is clearly not a standard novel. So I, I read it very much like a, a, a surreal stream of consciousness. Mm. And um, what was its saving grace for me at that time um, was, for, first of all, it begins, it, it's got a kind of gangsteristic feel to it at the beginning. So he was influenced by um, gangster writing, Chandler and um, Dashiell Hammett mm. and so on uh, at the beginning. So it begins with a very arresting uh, beginning, but I think what made me read it most at that time was the character of Doc Benway uh, and Burroughs writes a lot about doctors. Uh, in some ways he wanted to be a doctor and he started to study as a doctor but Doc Benway was um, a parody of the doctor. In fact he was an, an, an antithesis of a good doctor in many ways. He experimented on patients uh, uh, for his own scientific interests of um, mind uh, control. Uh, but it, some of the sketches and routines were very, very funny. And um, one of the sketches reminded me uh, where Doc Benway is removing an appendix uh, uh, on, on a ship. Um, reminded me very much of the behavior of one of my teachers, who was a, a surgical 
consultant at that time. Um, uh, of course, he didn't ki deliberately kill people. He had ethics, uh, wh which Benway probably didn't. But um, the approach, uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't seem quite as ridiculous as it might, might have seemed to people who didn't know anything about the medical profession. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, to, to give you um, an idea of the ward round of this particular consultant, we would um, uh, all, all we'd all have to have our shoes polished. We'd all have to be regimented. Uh, the nurses would be very uh, condescending to the consultant, who was literally like a god when mm. he went round. Mm. The patients, many of whom had had operations for lung cancer and were in great pain, had to, start, had to sit bolt upright in their beds as if to attention. He never spoke to any of the patients. He would whisper a word or two to one of the registrars and then pass to the next patient. So the patient never had any direct contact w w with him. And th these were the sort of things that made me, at the time, doubt whether I was in the right profession, mm. Mm. and which by reading Naked Lunch and the character of Benway, uh, it kind of made this worse, actually, because mm. it, it kind of stirred it a mm. little bit, because I could see through Burroughs' writing that there the, the was a... Uh, he, he'd been traumatised, I think, in his own many experiences with doctors. He'd, he'd been psychoanalysed for ten years of his life. He'd had to beg narcotics off... off doctors who just wrote prescriptions and never really cared mm. about how to treat mm. uh, and so he'd had very bad experiences with many many doctors um, so in the end um, I made a pact with him a sort of Faustian bargain and the bargain was that he would let me continue in medicine provided I listened to what he had to say mm. uh, and that I don't, I don't think he actually spoke to me. In, in so I didn't have a dream where he spoke to me and said that, but that's, that's how it came down to it. So I, throughout my career, I continued to listen to what he had to say, and I continued to read all his books. So this was end of the 60s? Into end of the 60s yeah. was when I read Naked Lunch. Yeah. yeah. And um, the medical profession at that time sort of had Very feeling of Victorian... Very still yeah, there. Yeah. So it's going to clash, wasn't it? There was, go there was yeah. going to be a, a yeah. clash. Yeah. Um, yeah how, how would you personally describe Burroughs? Um, I mean, I came to him after the Sgt. Pepper album cover, probably like a lot of people, um, or his name suddenly started popping up here and there. Um, how would you describe him yourself? I I, I think he was incredibly prescient. I think he was shadowy. I think he would probably uh, have been very frightening to meet if you met him on a one-to-one mm. -one basis. Mm. Although I've spoken to many people who have met him, mm. and one of the things that they always say about him was that he was incredibly courteous and gracious to everybody he met. It didn't matter if you were from whatever walk of life you came. He was very open. And I think that's what the beat philosophy taught all of us. And that had a great influence on, uh, the, for example, the Liverpool poets of the, of the 60s. So the, 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 Liverpool was influenced by the beats. Of course, Liverpool was influenced by everything that came out of America. But, mm. but it was, I think it did have a big influence on this city. And it, the, the, uh, the openness... Um, to, to people coming from all, you know, tree, it's a kind of natural democracy which mm. doesn't really exist very in many places. It exists on the, used to exist on ships, but it doesn't exist in the real world now. Um, and he 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 had that, I think. Uh, but he 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 learned a lot. I mean, one of he, his uncle, um, Bur Burroughs's uncle. He, he, well, I should say that he was he came from a middle class background. His his family were well off. The he came from St. Louis. Uh, his grandfather dis discovered an adding machine and made a fortune from it. He went to private schools. Uh, he graduated from Harvard University. So he had a very established uh, background, mm -hmm. and then he dropped out. 
Um, and he may have dropped out for many reasons. He may have dropped out because he wasn't really accepted because of his personality uh, and the fact that he was homosexual and homosexual was a criminal offense mm -hmm. in America at that time. Um, uh, but anyway, he, he, he dropped out. Um, so I, I think, but one of his uncles who influenced him very much was one of the first PR spin doctors. Um, uh, he was called Ivy Ledbetter Lee and he was the spin doctor for Rockefeller. Mm. And during the Second World War, he also became the spin doctor for Hitler, because Hitler um, H H Hitler was involved uh, was uh, involved with a company called Farben, which was a cartel of pharmaceutical companies in Germany, which involves Herxt and Bayer, some of the big companies now, and they were linked with a drug alliance with Rockefeller, uh, who had the drug alliance in the state, m massive pharma, uh, and. Hitler asked Burroughs' uncle how he could curry favor with the United States government. And uh, Burroughs' uncle went over to Germany on a couple of occasions and advised Hitler that it would, was no good writing there. He would have to try and arrange a face-to-face -face meeting in, if he wanted to get public support for what he was doing in the States at that time. So I think this um, family influence enabled him to see things long before any of us mm. could at that time. And uh, almost everything Burroughs said has come to pass. I mean, he was very sensitive about uh, the influence of control, the power of advertising, um, the, 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 you know, big organizations um, destroying uh, infrastructures and so on, th th this kind of thing. And that I learned a lot from him in that sense, which, because I think a, a lot of what he was saying, for example, about the corruption in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the, the placing of profit over uh, drug development, things like that, are, are implicit in his writing. Uh, uh, so I, I came to see him as a voodoo, you're asking me how I saw him, I came to see him as a kind of voodoo scientist and a prophet uh, r rather than just a writer. Um. So you have this awakening, uh, but you're a young man in this profession, the medical profession. I mean, that must have been a dangerous position to be in when you start thinking differently to what is the norm at that point, yeah. um, due to him and due to the times, really. Um, what did, how, how did you decide to carry on from there? Well, I split myself in half, basically. Mm. Um, because, and I think this is something which many doctors have to do. I mean, the art of healing and the pastoral aspects of good doctoring are one thing. And Burroughs had nothing to teach me about that. Mm. In fact, James Grauholtz, who was his close companion and lover for a period of time, who very kindly wrote the uh, foreword for my book, uh, said that many of uh, William's friends were relieved when he dropped out of medical school, as they were certain that if he'd continued in it, he would have killed many people. <laughs> uh, so he's got really right. nothing to tell anybody about how to be a good doctor. Yeah. But what? But I'd made this pact with him, uh, and what he had a lot to tell me about is how to do research, and how to find new cures or look for new mm. cures for devastating, incurable illnesses. So I kind of split myself into two bits, and I think sci if you talk, I'm doctors are never proper scientists. We we're, we're really more artists, but. We, we're encouraged to um, do clinical research and try to find better ways of uh, understanding the diseases that we treat and look for cures. And if you talk to um, most scientists, they will tell you that to be a good scientist, you have to be anarchic. Mm. Uh, uh, science is anarchic. Mm. And if you make a big discovery, you should expect that nobody's going to believe it. Uh, and you have to have the, the strength and the conviction to take through your beliefs, uh, even when you know you're going to get a great deal of resistance, and you have to take risks. So to follow process, uh, e even the academic... So I, in, in my book, uh, I don't just criticize 
uh, the pharmaceutical industry, everybody criticizes the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry, but it's other organizations which are just as much to blame. Uh, the government, uh, who don't really uh, sponsor uh, drug development, they leave it all to private enterprise. Um, the universities who are submerging why, in, why in does paperwork. Why the government do that? I don't know. Um, money? Money, probably. Yes. And, okay. um, they, they, it, for, for example, I mean, just to give you an example about that as a problem, if, if, for example, in my f field of research in Parkinson's disease, um, over the last three or four years, several drugs have disappeared suddenly from the market. Uh, these are because they're what in the pharmaceutical business are called mature products. In other words, they're old drugs. They sold for 10p for a, a month's treatment, very cheap. Mm. So there's no profit to be made out of them, but they're still very useful drugs. Mm. And so these drugs suddenly mysteriously disappear from the market and patients with Parkinson's disease can no longer obtain them. Now the government does nothing. It's, it, it's left to the retailers, the pharmaceutical industry to provide that. And if it disappears, it disappears. So, you know, that, that, that I'm, I'm really, I suppose, giving you one example of where I think the government could be more proactive, not necessarily in providing loads of money for new drug development, but at least making sure that the, re the, the legislation makes sure that the pharmaceutical companies uh, continue to guarantee supplies mm. of drugs that we know are effective and useful. Mm. Uh, and then the university, um, as I say, the, the bureaucracy within a university is, is stifling now. I mean, it, if, you, if it's taking us three or four more, three or four times longer to do a clinical trial than it did 20 years ago, because of risk-averse society, um, uh, draconian ethics committees, so research and development departments, general, which is yeah. of course not just pervading a medical scientist's life, it's pervading all our lives. Yeah. And we're all <laughs> having to live with this. Mm. And who do we blame? Well, there's maybe we, bl we should blame ourselves for letting it happen. Mm. I mean, that's maybe who we should blame. But uh, certainly uh, medicine is now controlled by lawyers. So lawyers, set the agenda now as to what we can do and what we can't do. And I think that that may be why in my field uh, we haven't made as much progress in finding a cure for Parkinson's disease as I hoped mm. we would have done when I started off 40 years ago. This bureaucracy has come in during your lifetime, yeah. do you feel, and, and grown? Oh, massively. It's yeah. changed dramatically. When, yeah. I, uh, when I became a consultant in 1982, which was Incidentally, on the, on the very same day that William Burroughs came to Liverpool for his first and only visit, uh, through the re he came with the Real Academy, he did a gig at the Hacienda Club in Manchester, and then he gave um, a reading uh, here on Mount Pleasant in a hotel that no longer exists, and at a bookshop that sadly no longer e exists called Atticus yeah. Bookshop, you may remember it. Um, he, he did a signing there. Um, so on that day, uh, and at that time, we had much, much more freedom mm. to do research. Uh, and we could do wa wacky things. And to give you one example, um, I, I used to try medications on myself before I tried them on patients. And that's another thing I learned from William Burroughs. I mean, he, of course, was and the, the, the self-experimenter of, of all self-experimenters. And I mean, Dr. Jekyll. And Dr. Jekyll, yeah. and of course he, you know, Timothy Leary uh, yeah. said, Burroughs knows more about psychedelic drugs than I'll ever know, because yeah. he tried everything yeah. before Leary became t telling us all to turn on and drop out, you know, tune to in. switch on, to tune in, switch <laughs> on and it. drop out. Um, so he knew, so he, and we used to be encouraged to try the drugs. How, how do you we, make before that? before we gave them to patients? Now how this you is make that decision because that that's well, uh, to me it was a, to, alarm it's bells are ringing, aren't they? Well, that's one of the arguments now that's given. Eth ethics committees will now say you're putting yourself at unacceptable risk, and, and it's very you? dangerous. 
I, maybe we were, but yeah. it seemed to me an ethical thing to do. If I'm, give, if I'm going to give it, if I'm going to try something out on other yeah. people, yeah. I shouldn't know really what it does on <laughs> yeah. myself. Yeah. Uh, but the the culture has really changed now, mm. so it's considered subjective, biased, st statistically irrelevant. Many of the scientific journals will not publish uh, a self-experimentation project, so it's gone underground, mm. actually. What's happened is it's gone underground, so a lot of psychologists um, are, are testing drugs uh, away from the university. And self-testing self had been, I mean, been the norm, really, hadn't it, for, for forever? And uh, things like so. uh, ma many of the mavericks who uh, uh, have made major discoveries in medicine uh, did it through self-experimentation. Mm. I mean, it, it's got a noble history in medicine, mm. but it's, it's being rubbed out mm. by society, society's mm. opinions about things now. Parkinson's disease in particular, what, what led you into that area? That uh, I think, uh, I mean, in the, in the 60s when I did my first house job at St. Stephen's Hospital, in, so, so I did my training in the East End of London, which was in that day, uh, Cockneys were in the East End. There's no Cockneys mm. left in the East End now. They've all moved to the south of Spain or to Essex, the ones that are left, but the Co Cockneys have gone now. But the, I did my first house job in Kensington, and the, the, you know, it's West End and East End, it's mm -hmm. a very different uh, clientele and uh, an average um, night on call would be six overdoses and one elderly lady with a heart attack, so people were dropping acid, taking drugs, and we got a lot of self-poisonings in at that time, so it was a bit frustrating when you were trying to learn medicine, but I, I had the good fortune uh, during that job to try a new drug that had just become available for the treatment of Parkinson's disease called L-Dopa. Uh, it's an amino acid that's present in beans mm. and it is used to replace the dopamine deficiency which is present in the brains of people with Parkinson's disease. And this was, Parkinson's disease in the 60s was a death sentence so that people were uh, terrified of getting it. Doctors were frightened to tell their patients that they'd got it. And this was an incredible advance. Mm. Um, the tragedy is that L-Dopa, 50 years on, is now still the best treatment. So we're still using that drug. Despite all the advances in science development, we haven't done be better than L-Dopa. And um, at first we thought it was a cure, you know, the, so people, it, it produced Lazarus effect. I mean, people who were shaking, quaking in a wheelchair, dependent on their families uh, for everything, dressing, feeding, bathing, uh, could get out and live independent existences again. It was as traumatic as that. It was really an amazing thing. Uh, and we thought that that would continue. Now, unfortunately, it didn't, and some of you, some of the, who are people who are watching this may have seen Oliver Sacks' film Awakenings, which was partly the story of, uh, of a group of people with Parkinson's disease who received this drug mm. and did brilliantly for a while, but then side effects developed later. Uh, and the, the very beneficial effects tended to escape. It's still a wonderful drug, a fantastic drug. And, you know, in, in the field of... Parkinson's disease, we have so much more than, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, which is still effectively incurable. But we, it's been disappointing for me that we've not really done better than L-Dopa. But to answer your question, it was the miracles I was seeing in my everyday practice with this new drug that thought, you know, this is, this is where the action is and this is where I want to go. Uh, speaking of where you want yeah. to go, the Amazon beckoned. <laughs> <laughs> what was your thinking as you headed off um, up, the, up the Amazon? So, um, I, I've told you already that my original interests came from botany, natural history, mm. and I read the Victorian explorers, Richard Spruce particularly, who spent 17 years walking through the Amazon rainforest collecting flowers. Mm. So that, that was solidly there. Um, Richard Spruce also taught me that um, you need to also understand 
and learn from the ind indigenous people of the Amazon, who are really the guardians of a public library of knowledge. Uh, and that, you know, the Amazon has 60,000 plants in it. And as scientists, we can't possibly study 60,000 plants with pharmacology and chemistry. It's going to take us forever. It'll never happen. But if, if we go and study what the, the local people have learned uh, through mm. their... Well, actually, they believe that they learnt it from their ancestors who came from the Milky Way. The mm. co cosmic theories of uh, many of the Amazon Indian tribes are very, very advanced. I mean, they believe uh, that we all came from outer space uh, and we, they, they were brought to the Amazon and they had this ancient knowledge came with them. Uh, so they, they didn't learn by trial and error. So I, through reading Spruce, I, I, I got this feeling that, you know, we should listen to what the Indians know about medicinal plants because it'll be a fast shortcut. We can't mm. test mm. all these things. So I, you know, this was a thread through my ongoing research. But when I got to um, uh, 60, at the age of 60, I began to tread water and I began to run out of ideas. Mm. And I, I could, I was aware of this myself, you know, I was sitting there, I wasn't getting any new creative ideas very much. And um, I, we had, we have a lot of Brazilian um, postgraduates who come to my hospital and they spend time there studying. So I'd, I'd built up quite a lot of uh, contacts with Brazilian doctors who'd gone back there. And I used to attend medical conferences there. And some of them had told me about uh, ayahuasca and yage, uh, which are the same thing, which are a, a decoction of uh, plant medicines which are used to, by the Indians to put them in touch with their ancestors. Mm. And of course now I've become, Burroughs was one of the very first Westerners to try yage. He went into the uh, Amazon rainforest and had the good fortune to bump into an ethnobotanist called Richard Schultes, who is now the considered the modern father of ethnobotany. So he, he had a good mentor himself when he was there. Um, so this, um, the, this ayahuasca, which has now become a kind of a growth industry in the Amazon, it's a, I, ayahuasca tourists, many young people are going there to find themselves, to find cures from narcotic and alcohol addiction, post-traumatic stress disorder and so on. So it's become a bit kind of d debased in a sense mm. in that mm. it's a commercial business now. Uh, but I was very keen um, I, uh, because they, some of my colleagues had taken it and they said it had uh, changed, it had loosened some of their rigid structures in, in their brain and their way of thinking. Mm. I was kind of interested to take it and I'd never taken psychedelic drugs in the 60s because I, I was really, I think, frightened to take mm. them. I thought my mental... I, I, I was frightened of myself. I thought I might have a bad trip. But now you're 60. Now I was 60. 60. So yeah. I, I think there is something a bit more interesting in, in a, a, uh, somebody in his 60s taking mm -hmm. psychedelic drugs for the first how, time how did you than somebody in the, who's 18 taking yeah, them. Yeah. So, and, that, and I've written about that in the yeah. book. Uh, yeah. And I think it did, I mean, of course, it's easy to... Uh, I'm not going to bore any, any of the viewers of Bay Television with what my trip was like because uh, I know that's d f forbidden. Anybody who's a regular tripper, d telling everybody about what you, s what coloured lights you saw, and so. But it did, it did change my uh, way of thinking, and it, um, it, it, it gave me a freedom which I'd lost to take greater risks in my research. Would it have worked had you taken it when you were 18? Do you think? Or is that an impossible? I, it's really impossible yeah. to know, mm. but um, I, I don't know whether age al alters the effects of these mm. drugs on. Mm. Um, I, I suspect if I'd taken it when Burrow, I'd read Naked Lunch, I might have dropped out of medicine altogether. Uh, so I'm kind of relieved I didn't take it then. Creative um, thinking, it opened you up to more creative thinking, yeah. would you say? Um, yeah self-experimentation But I continues. think I've always done creative thinking. I mean, yeah. Creative thinking is a bit of a d debased. Hmm. Uh, I mean, 
I'm not sure what creative thinking is because uh, that's uh, I suppose it's uh, I mean what, what I see as creative thinking is bringing in uh, different influences yeah, uh, thinking from outside, different outside the box yeah so that I guess. Uh, I, I'm not just going to read the medical literature yeah. Yeah. and be, which of course is the mistake that many medical scientists do we, yeah. we the medical literature is so enormous that it takes us all our time to uh, just read yeah. the medical journals and keep up with that so I'm yeah. trying what, what, what it encouraged me to do is to bring in other influences and interests in my life mm. uh, and try and get a convergence uh, with what I'm trying to do, which is find cures for Parkinson's disease. So I, think, I think my Yage experience did help me with that. Were there failures and successes along the route there? Uh, well, it, it was only, I mean, it's only three or four years ago, right. so... Um, I, I, it, it's still to be, I still haven't found the cure for Parkinson's mm. disease. So, you know, somebody might, people might say, well, it, what good's it done him? He hasn't actually, but it set me on some new directions. And what, one of the um, new, what, one of the directions which I think Burroughs would have been very interested in is that we're now actually reinvestigating Yache itself mm. as a treatment for nervous diseases. Um, so not just as a mind-expanding, mind-altering drug, but as a drug that potentially could help neurodegenerative diseases. Mm. And um, mm. some of the viewers may know that after a moratorium of um, about 40 years, psychedelics are now again, we are now being allowed to test psychedelic drugs in medical research again, particularly in, obviously, in psychiatric illness in palliative care, uh, pe people who are dying, um, uh, so that slowly and very carefully, so as not to make the many mistakes which were made mm. with psychedelic research in the 60s, it's coming back. So um, in that sense, I think m maybe my Yahe experience is encouraging me to actually try Yahe as well as a, a treatment for Parkinson's disease. This is despite, you say it's coming back, despite the bureaucracy, the paperwork, the safety evaluations that you have to go through. Yeah. Where do we stand today on, on that in the medical profession? I mean, uh, do you see lights at the end of tunnels or I, I think are we messed up completely by it? Are we stifled by it? No, I think... And tomorrow, uh, perhaps, uh, is more important. Uh, where, where, where do you think that's going? Will... I think, I mean, my concern, is, you know, scientists have always had obstacles to yeah. to, to their research yeah. and they've always overcome them and mm. good scientists will overcome them because they've got uh, a vision and a mission mm. and a drive mm. and a determination. Uh, and, you know, many people play at science. Mm. It's, it's fun to play at science, but the good scientists will overcome it. But what 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 what, re what really I think concerns me a little bit is that there's um, in, in medicine uh, what I can speak only particularly about medicine it's becoming much more difficult for young people to combine a career in medical science with with doctoring so um, th there's a split really between um, research and clinical care and, uh, and my mm. belief and my career is a testament to that is that you need to continue to see patients uh, to to know the right questions to ask mm. so for example many people doing Parkinson's disease research now don't know what a patient with Parkinson's disease looks like never mind mm. what it's like to live with Parkinson's mm. and I, I think one, one of the really encouraging things which my Yahe experience also helped me to develop is that uh, I, I think we need to work much more closely in our research with patients now. So we need to treat uh, patients as equal partners mm. in designing our research projects. Mm. And this is, always, this is what Burroughs always wanted. I mean Burroughs um, saw himself as a kind of wacky scientist. I mean, he had a lot of harebrained ideas, orgone boxes, and he toyed with Scientology and m many things. But some of his ideas were quite solid, and he tried
to connect with scientists throughout his life, but none of them uh, really were prepared to accept him uh, as an equal. Mm. And I think my, this book that I've written is, I'm not necessarily saying I've treat, I'm treating him as an equal, but I have tried to listen to what he said. Mm. Um, of course, there's a generation of difference. But I mean, I've never met him, and uh, but but that doesn't mean that he can't be an influence on me. Mm. And in fact, even in my medical career, many of the main things that I learned when I was studying in medicine were original descriptions. So these were not necessarily uh, things I learned from my teachers, but they were, I went. I like to go back and read original descriptions of disease from the 19th century, because those descriptions spoke to me much more than textbooks. Uh, and they had a kind of vivid, colorful, mm. novel-like uh, uh, feel to them. And of course, some of Burroughs has that too. Some of his writing is brilliant. Mm. Um, and his description of what it's like to take certain drugs is, is very helpful. And when we discovered that some of our patients who had been on L-Dopa for many years were actually becoming addicted to a medicine, which seems like a, a t I mean, when, when I talked to colleagues about this, they said, how can, how, can you, how can you become addicted to a medicine which is curing a neurodegenerative disease? So it was a kind of a difficult concept mm. To, mm. for people to... Of course, we know that people can become addicted to painkillers and sleeping pills, but to become addicted to a drug which is treating trembling. Uh, but this does happen, and we have a small number of patients who are taking industrial doses of L-Dopa, uh, and when this was accepted and we published it, I went back to Burroughs and read Junkie. And if you read Junkie, um, you can understand the mechanisms of addiction. Hmm. Uh, so he t he, he, his descriptions of what causes addiction and that we can all become addicts and that we can all want and things other than narcotics can be addictive uh, anteceded uh, modern biological psychiatry by 20, 30 years. Mm. So, I, I, in that way, I, I, I've learned from him. And, you write and that's that, what the book's about. Well, yeah. you write yeah. that this is not so much a memoir as a fantasia. Yeah. And it certainly wasn't what I expected uh, uh, as a medical textbook, <laughs> um, if you like. Um, it was a joyous read that I could not put down um, from start to finish. Um, can you tell me something about the writing of the book? How, how, how did that come about? Because that wasn't your plan that at some point yeah. I will write a book. What, what brought, brought um, the book itself about? Well, I've always enjoyed writing. I mean, I, most of my writing's been medical. And of mm. course, we have a different language in medicine from literature. Um, and, of course, the, the, the language of medicine is quite restrictive if you like words and you, you have a love of language because you can't really use it mm. uh, too much. So, I, as I've got closer to retirement, I've wanted to branch out a little bit. Um, uh, the first book I wrote was a biography of Ray Kennedy, the Liverpool football player, who was one of my patients who developed Parkinson's disease. And that was fairly straightforward because mm doctors are used to uh, narrative and case histories and uh, d uh, understanding what it's like to live with disease. Um, but my second book about the city of Liverpool and my attachment to it and my difficulties in leaving it um, uh, w w was a bigger jump. And this one's been more, more of a bigger jump too. Mm. Um, I was... F Mentored by a madman, I, I think I would have been frightened to write um, 10 or 15 years ago when I was at the peak of my career, partly because I might have been uh, considered a dilettante or a bit of a wacky individual by conservative colleagues. And um, I told you already that I uh, am pleased to be a member of the medical profession. I like to be a doctor. And to be ostracized by my peers would have been uh, worse than being put in prison, I think. Mm. Um, so I was a bit frightened to write this book. Um, 
at that stage. Now I've got to a stage of my career where m maybe I don't care as much as I did about what my colleagues think. Uh, maybe I've become braver than I was. Um, uh, so that gave me the opportunity to write the book. Mm. And the book, although I live in London, uh, the book was inspired still by Liverpool. And Liverpool keeps coming into the book, mm. uh, uh, as you know, I know you've read it. So the, the first chapter is a little bit about Burroughs' arrival in Liverpool. The preface was written in the Hargreaves buildings, uh, where I usually stay when I come to Liverpool. Um, and the idea was um, first um, spawned, I think, in my head by a discussion with some friends in Liverpool in, on Smith Down Road in a cafe called Cafe Kerouac, which um, um, was run by a guy who sadly just died, who was a great fan of the Beats. And we used to talk about our own interest in the Beats and mm. so on when I used to come up to Liverpool. So uh, there is, there is a, a Liverpool touch in this book. Um, although, it's, of course, it's not a book about Liverpool really at all. No. Yeah. The book is out. What yeah. kind of reaction are you getting, particularly from uh, your world, uh, the medical world? Um, has, it, has there been time yet for it uh, to...? Not, not by the medical world, but it's been welcomed uh, provisionally by the Beat world, which is mm. still going. Of course, the, beat, beat establi the Beats have become an establishment now. I mean, mm. and there are... Mm eminent figures, these are parts of university curriculums yeah. and so on nowadays. So they, they've welcomed it greatly and I suppose they've welcomed it partly because it's new, because it's an interface, it's a, it's a different borderland than they're used to, well, you know, a serious medical doctor coming in onto this. So it's been reviewed by a, a lot of the beat blogs and, and so on, so they've immediately grasped it and yeah. welcomed it. Uh, the medical profession, I think, I, I don't know yet. Um, I think but certainly some colleagues have written to me uh, and congratulated me. Some of them have said it's quite courageous in parts. Others have said it's quite dark in parts. Mm. And others have criticised me a little bit for it being a bit pessimistic and um, that I shouldn't have been quite so critical about certain mm. blocks uh, uh, as I was. So, mm. you know, it's a kind of mixed... Uh, mi mixed review mm. but I I mean I, I really hope uh, in a way I hope that uh, although I've written it that I want it to have a, a, a wide readership and if it was just read by doctors and colleagues I would be very disappointed because I spent a lot of time trying to make this a book that was understandable for somebody who knew nothing about Parkinson's disease mm. uh, and that, that's something which many doctors struggle with because we we're used to t talking in a kind of jargon and mm. technical mm. way and then we think that everybody else understands that mm. uh, when they don't you know so I, I've spent a lot of time trying to make it um, understandable and I hope it will be so but, but one of the groups I really would hope that would read it would be young uh, young medical students who could take um, lessons from it and uh, most importantly that they need to be lights unto themselves and not just soak up what they learn from their teachers by all means but um, plow their own channel and mm. if they believe in something keep going for it and try and and try and find a mentor like Burroughs if they can like mm. I did I mm. mean Burroughs may not speak to them, but there must be other people who can speak to them mm. from disciplines not necessarily re directly related to medicine. Well, this book certainly spoke to me loudly. Uh, it was interesting hearing you describe um, yourself as an artist, really, in the writing of it. And, and I was trying to think what, 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 how to describe it. And I think it is. It's written by a musician. It's as if the book has been written by a musician. Uh, I don't think I've ever well, said I that before. the word fantasia, of course, from music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but that, that's absolutely yeah. perfect description of um, uh, a tremendous book and beautifully bound book too, I have to say. Andrew, Liverpool, the Hurricane Port, um, another fantastic read, I have to say. Um, how did 
the book came about. Um, quite different to Mentored by a Madman, um, but of course tying into your life very much so. Uh, how did, how did it, what are the origins of this book? Well, well I think it, it was an attempt by me to get Liverpool out of my system, yeah. but it failed unfortunately. <laughs> right. uh, that was really the, 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 the driving force behind it, yeah. but I wanted to exorcise this um, preoccupation with trying to bring everything back to Liverpool. How interesting, because you left Liverpool as a f uh, young no, no, boy. A very young boy, yeah. But it yeah. remained with you. Yeah. It remains yeah. with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. remained with me as a sort of um, dream as, of being an intergalactic highway. So not only could you take ships to every part of the world in the 50s, but mm. I began to believe that you could actually take spaceships to... Uh, different places. Well, it's the centre of <laughs> and the that's universe, where of course William it? Burroughs came in yeah. a little bit because he he saw the salvation for the human race of leaving this earth and as many of his ideas were very prescient and I think he may well be right about that too as space truck you know we, we the only civil, the only hope for this earth may be that we all take a spaceship somewhere you know. Start so I, and maybe from Liverpool, you know, from maybe it'll be the, uh, well. The centre yeah. of the universe, it has been known as as that, hasn't exactly. it? Exactly, um, Allen Ginsberg, and yeah. Let's go right back to your childhood. Uh, you mentioned uh, a little bit about it before coming down to the docks. Liverpool's home for you? Uh, yeah, my my spiritual home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least my spiritual city. Of course, I. Mm. You know, in Liverpool, I'm not considered a Scouser because I'm from St. Hel I was born in St. Helens, but mm. um, uh, at least that's part of Merseyside. And uh, yeah. the, the influence, um, I think, of those, the time I spent with my father on the bus from St. Helens to Liverpool and looking out at the distant horizon mm. and watching the ships as a kid has had, a, uh, for, for reasons which I've tried very hard to rationalize over the last 40 years, had a, a, a very important influence on me. It Is may that? just be the bonding of a, yeah. a young son gonna, with his father. I was going to say it was a happy and that childhood. Was a happy childhood so, yeah. and, and, and that's one of the things I remember very much. Yeah. What yeah. else do you remember about that period? We're talking the 50s, yeah. early 60s yeah. maybe? Yeah, yeah. Well, what's uh, happening in this city at that point well, that you're I, aware I, of? Well, I, I, I remember it being very frightening to me coming from the little town of St. Helens mm. with these huge black buildings, so uh, black. sooty black yeah. buildings with gulls flying in the gaps between the, the buildings and um, uh, full of uh, the streets, not like now, full of people. Mm. I mean, I remember it being a, a very bustling city, mm. a busy city. Uh, and I also remember actually people talking to me in the street, which of course was when, when I moved first to London was something I greatly missed uh, much later mm. on and when I went to university in London. Uh, so the, the, the strangers would come up and talk to my father and you know, and then they'd have a few words with me too, mm. and I remember that. Uh, so the city fascinated impression. you? Yeah. And yeah, has remained yeah. a fascinating place. I, I think especially the docks fascinated mm. me, really. And yet you went from that to Leeds. Yes. And of yeah. course this is pre-Harvey Nick's days in Leeds. Yes. When it was the epitome of grim up north. Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah. Because I, um, I remember Leeds those days myself. Yeah, yeah. It, it was difficult for me, um, uh, you know, so I, I, I give this story and people say, you know, oh, I moved five times in my childhood, it didn't have any effect on me, it mm. didn't bother me, mm. and it, I enjoyed moving from one place to another, but so I, I, I suppose the effect it had on me is telling you something perhaps about me and uh, my personality, maybe I don't like change too much. Mm. Uh, I'm fright maybe I'm frightened of change. Uh, so this was a very traumatic event for me, mm. moving from um, St. Helens to Leeds. And I, I suspect that although my father saw the sense in moving because it was a promotion and an advancement in mm. his career as a teacher, he, he had regrets too because he was very happy here. Um, and that regret might have spilled over to mm. me without him ever saying anything. 
but what I do know is when we uh, lived in Leeds, we didn't really... Um, uh, we, we, we lived in Leeds as exiles, really, uh, and we remained people from Lancashire mm. and the North West. My, pa my, my, my parents, both my parents' family are from the Manchester area for 200. We've traced the family tree back bo on both sides. The, the, they never moved, you know, so they, they lived around Greater Manchester for 200 years. So the Lancashire Red Rose thing was very, very, very strong. Mm. Um, and I missed the excitement of going down to the docks mm. you know, when I moved there. Mm. You mentioned um, that it was to try and exorcise Liverpool, um, and that didn't work. What is it about Liverpool? What is it about Liverpool? Um, I'm, I'm particularly thinking if you go overseas, if you get outside of Britain and mention the name Liverpool. Uh, people fall at your feet, uh, particularly yeah. in America yeah. and um, other countries around the globe. Yeah. What's that all about? Because that doesn't happen, I think, if, if you were to say, I came from Leeds. It would have zero effect everywhere on the planet. Yeah. But Liverpool, yeah. what is it? Can you sum up? Well, well I, I, I think it, I mean, it used to, pre-60s, of course, it used to be that many people in the New World especially, well, throughout the world, had connect, direct connections with Liverpool as mm. a great mm. port. Uh, so it was branded as a port. And I suppose it, it's, it's in the same way as, um, I suppose, some cities now with big airports have, um, have become major cities you know in London for example they're, they're always worrying that Heathrow isn't big enough mm. to uh, mm. because Heathrow is so important as a, a network hub uh, and Liverpool was like that in a sense people came from all over uh, northern Europe to take the crossings uh, mm. to the states and uh, many people in America have direct connections mm. with with the city and then of course the Beatles, which um, has had a, an amazing influence, I think, and a lasting influence. Mm. Um, so I go, you, you mentioned some places, but if, if I go a lot to South America. I have a lot of connections in South America. The Beatles are as big in South America now as the, they were probably in the 60s and 70s. Mm. So wherever you go, people know about them. Many people, you hear the music playing uh, very, very frequently in Rio, in uh, Bogota, uh, all over South America. So, uh, you know, I think Leeds doesn't have that. It, it has the Kaiser Chiefs, but, you know, <laughs> you know one or two other. So it may, may be things like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 There have been other books written about Liverpool. Um, what sets this apart? Um, it's different about well, this it, book. It, it was, some people tried to brand it as a social history, and I didn't really, mm. I, I don't it's, it's not a book. Of course, I've tried to talk about the, the history of the city as a way of trying to understand what fascinated me about it and why I've been drawn to it. Uh, uh, so there are, of course, chapters about its development and its history. Uh, uh, but it, it focuses a lot on the dark times, I think. Uh, there are a lot of chapters of the 80s, uh, and I think that was a time when I started to come back a lot to Liverpool to just walk around and I saw the devastation and, the, and, and I think that, I mean this has always been a, a dramatic city, a cinematic city, a, a city of ups and downs yeah. uh, and a city in, in a way which d differentiates it very much from Leeds in that it's dictated by the tides. I mean I think that this is a city that uh, the, the, the lunar calendar is still important here mm. and that I think reflects the personality of the people here mm. so you, you're dealing with you know this is a, a city built on a river the the, the changes from t 10 meters from high to low tide mm. and the, the history of the city is related to rhythm biological rhythms related to the sea mm. and I, I think that 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 must have an influence on um, how people are in this city mm. and how they look at things. Mm. And I've tried to just 
touch and, and develop a little bit about that in the book. Mm. Uh, why, it, why that should be, what are the differences? Mm. Um, and, you know, the, 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 that's one of the things that, that I see as important about this place. It's um, been a place of comedy, music. Yeah. Um, what, what, what makes those two, well, the arts really, what makes those stand out in this place more than your normal city? I think drama is mm. in the blood here. Um, talking is, of course, <laughs> something that Liverpool people have even been criticised for <laughs> uh, by st some people who don't really understand the importance of, uh, of talking as a way of communicating information. Um, uh, so, you know, the, there's those sort of things. And I think... Um, you know, I, I don't think, I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but I think deprivation encourages the arts too. So I think in these difficult yeah. times over the last 40 years, which hopefully the city's coming more and more out of now, that that has helped um, to inspire art to mm. a certain degree. Mm. Um, and of course, it ha you know, laughing at misery is is one way of dealing with it too isn't it so mm. this is one, mm. one of the reasons why it's always said that comedy is so strong uh, in 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 the northwest generally i i also think you know the mix of people is in, important mm. you know the the irish influence the welsh influence uh, the, these give a set liverpool apart a little bit from the rest of e even from manchester which of course has these influences too but uh, I think there is a difference, yeah. Well, the time you were growing up, of course, it was a blitz city. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, the yeah. regrowth hadn't started, wouldn't start for many, many yeah. years. Um, do you think that had an impact on the, on? Not the really. I remember when I used to come with my, my father, I remember seeing wasteland and bomb site, areas of the city that were devastated and bombed. Yeah. Um, but of course, it was, was post-war. Um, uh, I also remember, I mean, it was an important thing was at that time was sugar. Um, and sugar was a luxury in, uh, at that time after the war. You know, it was rationed mm. and everything. But sh so sugar, I remember um, things like uh, buying treacle in Liverpool, uh, but uh, tins of treacle, black treacle, um, and putting sugar on bread mm -hmm. and having it as a sandwich. Mm. And this city came, I mean, in a way came to be associated for me with sweetness, not necessarily light, because I saw it as a very dark city in mm. many ways. But there was this sweetness, and sweet, with sweetness is, uh, there's an exotic aspect of sweet, you know, where it's for, forbidden, it's naughty but nice. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that, in a way, that's what Liverpool is, it's naughty but nice, yeah. So, and I linked it with sugar, and of course, and I remember um, with my father one day we watched um, uh, molasses being brought in from, actually it was from Brazil, which is uh, sugar coming in from Brazil um, we, uh, uh, to, to the Tate and Lyle factory on the, uh, from Huskinson Dock on the Tate and Lyle, on Love Lane. Mm. Uh, where the, the Tate and Lyle refinery was, and I, I kind of made this link with sugar somehow as well. So it, it had that, uh, that connotation to me as well at that time. Not just the distant horizon looking out to sea, mm. uh, cosmic crossroads, mm. uh, all these sorts of things, but, but those things too, yeah. You mentioned danger, the danger, danger and uh, sweetness and danger. Life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The pool of life. Yeah, there exactly. There we go, yeah. yeah. Um, as a neurologist, what's your take on Liverpool thinking? You mentioned the tides coming in and out, which I, I think is absolutely fascinating, having um, uh, a, a reaction on, on the people of the city. Um, as a neurologist, studying the Liverpool brain and nervous <laughs> system, <laughs> what do you make of it? Because um, it is quite unique, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of study that people are interested in doing now. Oh. Uh, and it's, it's what neurologists see a little bit as 
it's, it's not exactly voodoo science, but it's a, it's a bit soft because we don't really know what it means. But for example, we could put your, you in a functional MRI scan mm. and try and compare your brain with somebody from Manchester or Leeds mm. and see, which, mm. see, see if your way of thinking and your way of um, looking at the world in response to certain stimuli mm. uh, was different in some way. So it's it's very exciting, and you know I you can see you can see yeah. why this is yeah. taken over from philosophy and universities. Yeah. This kind of neurophiliac approach to things because it is so interesting. Yeah. But it's you, you know these these machines are uh, c certainly we can see things lighting up in different parts of the brain mm. in response to different things, but the interpretation of quite what it means mm. is still really in its infancy, I think, at this point. So one's got to be a little bit careful about what one says. And There's a uni it, universe in there, yeah. and then some, I yeah. guess. Um, so, yeah, I mean, may maybe the Liverpool brain is wired up a little bit different. I mean, that, that mm. of course, raises issues about um, how, how much of us is g genes and how much of it is our early influences and so on. And, that's a curate's egg of a problem, mm. and mm. I don't have the answers to that. We follow um, Liverpool uh, from the Vikings through to today. How do you see the future of the city? Uh, well, it's, it'll be, you know, sit, it's, it's like life, cities change. They're not, they, they're not, they're not um, and there may be many cities within a city, uh, mm. if we look carefully within li Liverpool or with any city. Um, uh, clearly, it's not going to be one of the great ports of the world anymore. And maybe uh, sea transport will get less, I don't know, in, in the future anyway. But, um, so it's got to find new ways of reinventing itself. Well, it's got to move on. Um, um, how, how will it move on? Well, I, I personally hope it will consider, continue to be a center of uh, the arts, literature and culture. I mean, that would be my hope for the city, uh, uh, that that money could be found to develop that, uh, and, and so that it becomes, well, it always has been, but it, 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 its creativity and inno innovation is, is encouraged, and um, uh, everything isn't moved to, in, in that aspect, moved to London like the Beatles mm. had to do, you mm. know, for example, mm. so that that could actually be developed here. I mean, what I see when I walk around is, of course, it's become the cruise liners are back now, which is good. Mm. I mean, that's good. Many people have sentimental memories of Cunard and, and so on here, and it ca can't be bad. Mm. Uh, I see increasing tourism. Um, which could be good. <laughs> I mm. mean, if it brings money to the city, mm. that could be good, provided it's managed properly. And I see thousands and thousands of students here. Mm. It's become a, a place of education, mm. which um, mm. is good and uh, should be encouraged. I mean, there's nothing more important than education. So mm. it's also, I mean, look from my. From a medical perspective, I also see it as um, a flagship for the National Health Service because uh, I think although not all the major innovations in medical science are happening in Liverpool, there are some, but it's probably no more than its share. I think the, the, the dedication to the National Health Service here is is much stronger than, for example, in London. I mean, it's it's there's there's a much greater commitment to making the NHS work here uh, than I see in London, where we're being slowly taken over by private medicine and private healthcare insurance uh, gradually. Um, so, um, so I would hope that it, you know, it continues to be a place. For, for health, you know, uh, and uh, health so that people are all treated equal, you know, that you don't, you're not treat, you're not going to have two or three levels of health care depending on your income, mm. you know, that everybody's mm. treated mm. the same. Mm. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the future for you. Uh, Liverpool has you, obviously it's yeah. got you for life. Yeah. Um, writer, more writing yeah. in the yeah. works. 
yeah. I'm going to write. Um, I mean, I'm going to write. I'm going to develop this theme of sugar. I think, um, and Liverpool as candy town. Um, huh. uh, that that that's a book I'm going to do next. Huh. I haven't quite worked out how I'm going to do it, um, but one idea might be that um, uh, there's a sugar lump with something on it, and the sugar lump is not necessarily what you think is on it. It won't be. It won't be stated what's on this sugar lump and when you take this sugar lump in Liverpool you start to see things because I think this is a psychedelic city too and that's where where I link it a little bit with um, uh, I think you can hear that in the music to a certain degree mm. that this is a the influences of psychedelia are greater here than in Manchester for example mm. Mm. so I'm, I'm going to try and develop that idea of the city the distant horizon the infrastructure of naughty but nice, sugar, you know, so that, that's my kind of, the, the idea I'm thinking of for the follow-up book now, yeah. I'm <laughs> in the queue, waiting for that book. <laughs> that is wonderful. Uh, um, Andrew, it's been a delight to talk to you, and um, yes, many more books, please. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.